All right, good morning, good afternoon um, for those who are in East Africa. Thank you very much for joining today's forum on advancing US trade and investment in East Africa. This is a collaborative effort between AMCHAM, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. <clears throat> My name is Maxwell Okello. I'm the Chief Executive of the American Chamber of Commerce in Kenya. I would like to recognize and thank the US Department of Commerce Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Middle East and Africa, Camille Richardson, the US Ambassador to Rwanda, Ita Woman, the Chargé d'Affaires, US Embassy Kenya, Eric Needler, Deputy Chief of Mission, US Embassy Uganda, Christopher Kraft, Board President, Amcham Kenya, Brenda Mbathi, Board President, Amcham Rwanda, Lauren Krunga, Board President, Amcham Uganda, Mike Davis, Board President, Amcham Ethiopia, Emias Eshatu, Board Members, Amcham Tanzania, Board Member, excuse me, Amcham Tanzania, Joseph Shefu, who's representing the Board President of Amcham Tanzania, Vice President, US Africa Business Center, the US Chamber of Commerce, Kendra Gaipa, the Director of Government Affairs for Africa, Abbott, Kululiwe Mabaso, various US government representatives on the call, members of AMCHAM Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Ethiopia, members of the US Chamber, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Thank you all for making time to join us this, uh, for this session. I also want to take this early opportunity to recognize and appreciate most sincerely our main sponsor, Abbott, as well as our supporting sponsor, Ecobank Rwanda, for their sponsorship of today's forum. Before we begin, some quick housekeeping. The forum will be 90 minutes long, so one and a half hours. We will have the keynote address by our chief guest, followed by two panel discussions. The first featuring uh, the chiefs of mission to Rwanda, Kenya, and Uganda followed by a second panel featuring board presidents of AMCHAM Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. Given the time that we have, we will not be fielding questions during this forum. However, we encourage you to leave your comments in the chat uh, tab as we, as we progress. So ladies and gentlemen, despite the, dis the, the, the disruptive impact of COVID-19, East Africa remains the fastest growing region in Africa. According to Statista, despite the setback in 2020, the region's GDP is projected to grow at 3% this year, with an even higher projection of, in 2022 of 5.6%. As the region starts to look beyond pandemic recovery, there's a unique opportunity for the US government, as well as American companies to demonstrate commitment and leadership in advancing trade and investment with the region. All this as a pathway towards economic recovery and greater resilience. Today's forum is therefore intended to be a platform to share insights, to hear perspectives, and explore opportunities to advance greater trade and investment between the US and East Africa. So before I bring in our chief guest to give a keynote, I would like to invite our main sponsor, Abbott, represented here today by Director of Government Affairs for Africa, and a true friend of Amcham, Kululiwe Mabaso, to give some brief remarks. Over to you, Kulu. Uh, thank you, thank you, Maxwell. Um, to the US Department Assistant Secretary of the Middle East Africa, Honorable Ambassadors, Embassy staff, um, former and current AMCHEM presidents, leaders of the East African private sector, greetings and all protocols observed. We are really looking forward to the discussion on advancing trade and growing the economy uh, in East Africa today. This is, as you said, Maxwell, the fastest growing region in Africa, and it's really important to Abbott as well. It is clear that more work still needs to be done to ensure that people are kept safe and have the confidence as they come back to the new normal uh, post the pandemic. At Abbott, our mission is to create life-changing health technologies that help people live life to the fullest. 
And you may ask, how did we do this during these tough times? Through several months, uh, through these several months with our partners, with the East African government stakeholders, the generous US funders and the US government, we have ensured that uh, Abbott was able to provide sufficient COVID tests across East Africa. These range from PCR testing to rapid testing, which results could, one can receive their results within 15 minutes. We have also provided support for viral surveillance to monitor the different variants, as we know that this virus keeps mutating to ensure that our tests are effective all the way and every time. The latest in the technology of, of this uh, COVID testing is the self-test. And why is it important and why does Africa need self-test? This will enable, I think, the economy to grow more because it means that the East African community and the people would now be helping and working with the government to self-test at home, to isolate and also manage the spread of the virus, even for asymptomatic patient in a better way as the economy opens. So this is an important technology that needs to be welcomed in East Africa as well. Other countries have already adopted this and we hope that the East Africa governments will adopt self-tests as well. I think while the East African government is hard um, at work in ensuring that people are, it is clear that more testing still needs to be done to ensure that we keep the virus, I think, at bay and we keep managing it as we open the economy. Because there is nothing as frustrating as having lockdowns opening and closing the economy. It's not sustainable for the economy. We need to open the economy in order to continue to grow in a more sustainable way. This, I think the rapid tests that uh, Abbott is bringing can also be used to open schools in work areas for sports, uh, for border post and mostly in, Afri in East Africa, as we know that in tourism, tourism is one of the key sectors that drive the economy. They can, it can also contribute towards that. So we're looking forward to the discussions today and um, thank you again to all the guests that will give us insights of how we can do this more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kulu, um, for those remarks and of course for your generous sponsorship of today's forum. I also want um, to thank our supporting sponsor, Ecobank, a world-class financial institution and a torchbearer for Africa with presence in 35 sub-Saharan African countries, providing wholesale retail investment and transactional banking services to businesses of all sizes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor to introduce our chief guest and keynote speaker the U.S. Department of Commerce Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Office of Middle East and Africa, Camille Richardson. Camille is a tenured Senior Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Commercial Service, having begun a career in government with the International Trade Administration, ITA, at the U.S. Department of Commerce in 1993. She became an accredited diplomat uh, with the U.S. Commercial Service in 1998 and has served six successive tours of duty in Miami, Florida, um, in Argentina, um, in uh, Brazil, in Nairobi, Kenya, I must say, um, in Mumbai, in India, in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, facilitating commercial partnerships between the US and local companies. So um, with that, Camille, over to you. The screen is yours. You can go ahead and give your keynote remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxwell and uh, Jumbo, everyone. Good morning to those of you on this side of the Atlantic. It's a rainy day here in Washington, and I hope I don't mess this up too much in Chama Muena for those of you on the other side of the pond in East Africa. I'm so thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, as many of you know, I'm very familiar with this region as I served uh, for as a senior commercial uh, officer as the uh, commercial counselor at our embassy in Nairobi 
from 2010 to 2013. And I'm always delighted uh, when my work brings me back to the East Africa community, um, even if only virtually right now. Um, as all of you know, in February, <clears throat> President Biden spoke at the 34th Africa Union Summit and just a few days ago at the UN uh, General Assembly. And he made it clear that his administration is committed uh, to both rebuilding our partnerships around the world, including in Africa, as well as growing trade and investment in a way that advances the prosperity of all countries. So I underscore the importance of our strong economic and trade relationship, especially during these times, as Kulu pointed out, we're all seeking ways to recover from this global pandemic. And certainly trade and investment is a proven way of doing that. And so we know that the Biden administration is committed to deepening uh, the United States partnership with Africa and opportunities like this one are a wonderful way to reach out um, to both the public and the private sectors and to engage your thoughts as thought leaders on ways in which we can effectively do that. That said, you know, as Maxwell mentioned, the EAC does continue to be one of the leading regional economic communities in Sub-Saharan Africa and has made great strides in recent years, integrating the economies as a custom, and as a customs unit and working toward a common market. As a testament of the promise of the region, the US Trade and Development Agency, also known as USTDA, one of our sister agencies, has 25 active projects and is obligated nearly $22 million in East Africa and Ethiopia alone. As well, the Biden administration's Build Back Better World, what we call B3W here in Washington. Uh, this initiative is directly uh, directing our focus as a US government on infrastructure opportunities throughout Africa. We've hosted several webinars here at Commerce on this topic, and we're planning to host our flagship trade event called Trade Wins uh, that will bring US companies focus on areas within the infrastructure sector uh, that align with the Biden administration's top priorities. And so we're focusing on transportation, logistics, supply chains, uh, water, of course, uh, in the infrastructure sector, as well as healthcare, super important, uh, as Kulu pointed out, uh, agribusiness, super important for food security, aerospace defense security would be another sector that we're prioritizing, energy, as well as the digital economy. And I would just add two more to that list. Uh, one is cross-cutting, that would be water, which has an impact on everything, um, as well as fintech and education. So we're looking at services exports as well. And like everyone else, we're having to incorporate the global pandemic precautions in our planning. So please stay in touch with us regarding the exact timing of the Trade Winds event where we're bringing all of our top commercial diplomats throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the Middle East, um, as well as our partners from the State Department from Key Post to Dubai, and this would be March 6th through 8th, the Trade Winds event. Uh, we hope to make it a, a big mission and we hope to also engage our Secretary of Commerce at the event. Uh, and hopefully somebody from my team or someone from um, the US Chamber is able to put uh, the link to that event for more information into the chat box. So as I mentioned, we are, as we all know, in the midst of managing the impacts of the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And we have seen the associated alarming statistics, in particular, how many of the new cases are coming from this Delta variant. And I think we're also beyond Delta, we're at mu, but everyone's focused on Delta right now. In East Africa, uh, pre-COVID-19 uh, projections show that the region's real gross domestic product uh, growth had been recovering slightly. It had been estimated to be at 5.4% in 2021. I think that sinks with what Maxwell just said. Uh, and the region's growth seems to have been driven by strong public set spending on infrastructure, rising domestic demand, uh, the benefits of improved stability, new investment opportunities, and incentives for industrial development across its regional community. As reported by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, or UNECA, Notwithstanding the impact of the economic crisis uh, precipitated by the global pandemic, since May 2020, intra-regional trade in East Africa has shown significant resilience with a notable positive correlation with measures put in place to protect 
transport corridors from severe disruption. So congratulations to East African community leaders for that. Amidst the optimistic outlook of the region, I urge you all to stay vigilant. We are still prone to a variety of vulnerabilities. So to support you in responding to this pandemic, it's my understanding that the United States has provided almost $100 million to Uganda in direct assistance specifically for, to prevent, detect, and respond to COVID-19. And as recently as this month, the United States has donated a total of 2,321,350 COVID-19 vaccine doses to Uganda. Tanzania has received a donation of 1 million doses of the COVID-19 vaccination to date. And in Ethiopia, the United States has provided over one and a half million doses. Rwanda will be in receipt of over 1 million doses once the latest shipment arrives. And in Kenya, the US provided millions of dollars in equipment, supplies, training, and research, including substantial contributions to COVID-19 testing and sequencing. In addition uh, to these and other donations to individual countries, the United States has invested hundreds of millions of dollars to the World Health Organization's COVAX mechanism to contribute to the global efforts to include uh, all countries in Africa. I think it's worth noting that earlier this week, the UN General Assembly, President Biden said, and I quote, the US has spent more than $15 billion toward global COVID-19 response and is committed to purchasing 500 million vaccine doses for use by the World Health Organization, uh, end quote. And the president also called for a new global health mechanism to finance global health security and a global health threat council to stay ahead of emerging pandemics. So conquering this global pandemic and facilitating a robust global eco economic recovery are interconnected and are top priorities of this administration. We are working towards implementing policies beneficial to substantial regional integration, inclusive of all of our respective citizens as we rebuild. Broadly speaking, looking at the, the continent writ large, we see the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA, as an instrument that will support intra-African trade, and which is ultimately good for all trade in this region. Last year, the World Bank released a report that said that the AFCFTA could boost regional income by 7% or $450 billion and lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty by 2035. However, as the World Bank's chief economist for Africa stated, and I quote, successful implementation will be key, including careful monitoring of all workers, women and men, skilled and unskilled across all countries and sectors, ensuring the agreements will benefit, end quote. At Commerce, we agree with this, and we will provide technical assistance as countries work to implement this agreement. So I'd like to actually, speaking of the Department of Commerce, I'd like to highlight a few initiatives that I think would be of interest to you as business people. Um, and these we believe will strengthen uh, our ability to help more US private sector uh, companies recover from this pandemic and join the ranks of those who export goods and services to this region um, as, as trusted partners. And all of these initiatives are tools to improve uh, the depth of American participation and strengthen our trade and commercial ties in these markets. And in an effort to institutionalize the emerging best practices of inclusion and capture key elements of lessons learned in the policy space, I've actually launched, launched a national listening tour on Africa, which I'll say a bit more um, in a minute. So let me start off by saying that, you know, as, as, the, as the US government, you know, as the Commerce Department, it's our mission uh, to grow economies, to grow the US economy, and to stimulate economic recovery. And we don't do it alone. We have a very small but very effective uh, diplomatic service, uh, the US Commercial Service. And uh, we've always partnered uh, to leverage um, the, the resources and, and the reach, uh, whether it's with another agency or whether it's with the private sector. So one of our key tools in our toolkit, one of our key um, 
uh, resources is an advisory committee, which is the President's Advisory Council on Doing Business in Africa, which is also known as the PAC-DBIA because we make acronyms out of everything. So for example, uh, last year, the PAC-DBIA delivered a comprehensive set of practical recommendations on the implementation of the Prosper Africa Initiative, which I'm sure you've all heard of, especially given the fact that the PADI contract was just put out yesterday. Uh, and earlier this year, we, con we conducted a fantastic webinar series with our PAC DBIA called Keys to Success in Africa, uh, which featured uh, many of our, our experienced uh, PAC DBIA members who were speaking on industry specific panels. And they, they've divided it into three parts, how to approach a market, how to compete in a market and how to succeed in a market. And I believe, and I know that these were recorded. So for those of you who missed this in very impactful series, and would like to take a look and, and just see what, where the opportunities are, what some of the sort of the keys to success are, I hope one of my colleagues is able to drop uh, that link in the chat space. So what we're also doing you know, on the government side is we realized that we have kind of a spectrum of opportunity. And so one of the first thing we, three things we did was we organized ourselves at the embassy and the consulate level into deal teams. So they're led by our ambassadors, uh, and typically wherever we have a commercial diplomat there, um, they're key advisors, uh, and key part and parcel of that. And they're able to coordinate interagency resources on the ground uh, to help US companies pursue projects. And we have a corresponding deal team here in Washington. Well, we also realized that a very key space that we could be playing to make US companies more competitive is on the front end. Uh, this is the space where USTDA typically works. Uh, the feasibility stage. We want to help U.S. companies uh, position themselves by building those key relationships with the decision makers before the tender is even put out on the street. And so we've created an early uh, trade lead system called Express Leads, Middle East Africa. Can you guess what the acronym is? It's ELMIA, and it allows us to identify priority trade leads in the overseas field on the front end. Right now, we're only doing it in the Middle East and Africa, and we're hoping to be able to roll this out um, across the world. And actually the idea came from Power Africa. They provided us with some seed capital. And one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that we were able to put aside some CapEx that we weren't spending on travel, for example, and broaden it beyond energy to cover the sectors that I mentioned, infrastructure, digital healthcare, um, agribusiness, uh, aerospace defense, um, and others, I think there's six, but I'm, I'm sure I'm missing one. But anyway, infrastructure is a key one. Um, so, so, so this is a complement to the deal team activity that's on the ground, uh, but we're able to, to get those early leads out. And we've just been beta testing um, this, 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 this new technology, which is based on Salesforce uh, with about three to 4,000 companies in the United States. And we've been refining it based on their feedback. It's been very, very successful so far. And it's not just for public projects, it can also be for private projects as well. So keep that in mind and reach out to the, us if you have interest in learning more. Another initiative that I'm super proud of that is near and dear to my heart is our Women's Empowerment Initiative. Uh, the title is Women Empowered Leave Legacies Through Trade and Investment. And the acronym is WELTI, which is of course a play on words if you are from the Caribbean. Um, so we're calling it Welty for short, and through a series of virtual events, uh, we have been connecting U.S. and African businesswomen as well as Middle, Middle Eastern businesswomen, uh, because we realize that women are among those hardest hit by the pandemic, and it has been the policy of our department to really strive for economic inclusion. Our secretary is championing this. Uh, women's empowerment is near and dear to her heart, so we were actually a little ahead of the curve. And so I'm proud to say uh, that since January, we actually launched our first Welty Coffee Chat in Kenya, uh, which was, I think, appropriate. And so we were giving women on both sides access to information, data, resources with a sprinkling of information, with a sprinkling of inspiration. We actually had a, a Kenyan woman, a businesswoman, highlight how she was able to overcome the challenges that are universal to all female entrepreneurs by trading and investing with the United States. And of course, we had a, an exporter in Miami immediately raise her hand and say, I'd love to do business with you. So we've had follow-ons from that initial chat. We've done other ones in Ethiopia. We've done, uh, we're doing one in Ghana next month. We've done South Africa. 
We've done several in the Middle East um, and where it's really quite, it's really taken off. Um, Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire also have come up. Um, so uh, we actually had a regional one with six AmCham's um, in key MIA markets, including Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, Jordan, and Morocco, South Africa, and UAE. And so this was a really big event. And we're, it's part of what I call the March to March. As I mentioned, we have the Trade Winds event happening in Dubai, we hope. It's just more of an in-person, but we are certainly going to do something, a wealthy summit in conjunction with trade winds on those dates. Um, and so we hope to have our secretary lead it. So again, tune in to that link that we hopefully were able to post or we can send around later in Dubai. And of course, I mentioned earlier that we don't do this alone. Uh, we are working with our interagency partners, the 17 US government agencies involved in trade promotion, uh, through the Prosper Africa Initiative, uh, you may have some of you may have heard Secretary Raimundo announce Commerce's continued support for Prosper Africa at the Corporate Council on Africa Summit. Um, we know that we can effectively marshal those resources of our sister agencies um, to increase two-way trade and investment. So while Commerce is more focused on exports and on inbound investment into the United States, we have other agencies such as USAID and others that are focused on African exports into the United States as well as US investment in Africa. So we want this to be uh, an effective, virtuous cycle of two-way trade and investment. Um, and since June of 2019, the US government has helped Prosper close 500 deals across 44 African markets with an estimated value of $47 billion and exports and investments. So hopefully someone is posting a, a link to the Prosper Africa USG toolkit so you can find out exactly which agency can help you. And of course, Power Africa was the original model for Prosper and other initiatives and we continue to partner with Power Africa as well. I did mention as a chapeau to all of this uh, that we have launched a national listening tour on Africa. We're always looking for ways to get inputs from the private sector um, and it's part of part and parcel of us creating a new commercial engagement strategy that is based on a true partnership with Africa. Um, and so these conversations during my virtual visits to the continent, as well as talking to our sister agencies, talking to experienced companies here, and, and of course there uh, will help us to put together um, a, a sustainable trade policy uh, that expands opportunity for all in the 21st century. This is just the beginning, but I'm excited about the potential of what we can achieve. Working together, we can deliver equitable growth and shared prosperity across all communities. So I'd like to have this engagement be part of that effort. And as we hear from key members of the public and private sector in this region, I'll be listening critically to gain a more granular understanding and glean insights that will inform our programming and policies. And specifically, I'm curious to hear about your challenges and successes and how the Commerce Department can best support trade with the US private sector, specifically during this difficult time, and what aspects of exporting have been well supported by US programs and policies. Also, what would a partnership approach look like to you in a new US commercial partnership with Africa? And given that small and medium-sized enterprises or SMEs are the backbone of most national economies, uh, the Biden-Harris administration has articulated a desire uh, when developing policies and programs to be inclusive of a larger swath of the US private sector to include SMEs, as well as the diaspora business community. So what are your thoughts on how we can do this? And let me close by saying uh, we recognize uh, how important engagements like this are to strengthening the trade relationship between your countries and the United States and the establishment of these lines of communication are critical elements of everything we build together for our shared and prosperous future. I thank all of you in advance for your generosity of your time and the candor of your views as we embark on the agenda before us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camille. Um, wow, you've covered so much in, in, in such a short time. Um, it, it's just mind boggling for me just how much is going on behind the scenes that may not be obvious to, to us. And indeed, it's, it's great to hear, you know, some of the exemplary work that uh, your office and, and the rest of the, um, you know, commercial and uh, um, economic sections um, 
behind the US government's initiative as far as the commercial partnership with Africa and specifically East Africa is concerned, um, driving this forward the trade and investment agenda. I think that's something that we really appreciate. And we've put a pin on uh, trade wins. I think that's something that we'll be very interested to hear more and see if there's an opportunity for us to, in some ways, partner and collaborate on that as well. Um, so thank you very much, um, Camille. Um, I want to switch gears and move on to the next, um, actually our first panel discussion um, featuring the chiefs of mission uh, to uh, chiefs of mission um, in the region, uh, US government chiefs of mission to the region. Um, and we will be discussing and exploring opportunities uh, for US government and private sector engagement to facilitate uh, support for a post pandemic uh, recovery. So we are pleased to have with us um, the US ambassador to Rwanda, Peter Vruman. Um, we have with us the Charge d'Affaires, uh, US Embassy Kenya, Eric Nidler, and the Deputy Chief of Mission, uh, US Embassy Uganda, Christopher Kraft. And many of you could turn on your videos. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick request um, for uh, Eric, if you don't mind, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a bit worried and concerned that I might hurt myself saying charge the affairs again. So can I just refer to you as <laughs> CDA? <laughs> How about Eric? Eric works just <laughs> Okay, great. <laughs> great. All right, so let's let's get into it. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, we'll start off with uh, your opening remarks. You each have uh, just suck at three minutes to make your opening statement. We'll start off with you, um, Eric, and then we'll go to uh, Ambassador Broman and we'll finish off with Chris, Christopher Kraft. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Maxwell, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. It's a real pleasure to be with you all uh, today. I'd like to start by expressing my appreciation to all of our regional AmCHAMs for organizing this very timely event. Increasing US bilateral trade and investment with Kenya is a key objective of our mission, and I know that that applies uh, to our colleagues across East Africa. As nations continue to fight for lives and livelihoods, the collective fight against COVID-19 remains an area of priority for us. The United States is pleased to be part of a coordinated global effort to bring life-saving vaccines to the people of Kenya. And to date, uh, as Des Richardson just uh, mentioned, we've brought to uh, Kenya nearly 4 million doses of Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, to complement this vaccine donation, USAID and the US Centers for Disease Control have invested nearly $5 million to support COVID-19 vaccine rollout throughout all of Kenya. We recognize that economic recovery depends on both uh, addressing the pandemic as well as building long-term resiliency in the health sector. Turning to the economic and commercial front, the United States-Kenya bilateral partnership remains very strong and that's highlighted by our ongoing bilateral strategic dialogue and its economic pillar. Moreover, Secretary Blinken's first engagement in Sub-Saharan Africa was a virtual visit uh, with President Kenyatta here in Nairobi on April 27th. During that visit, the Secretary reaffirmed our commitment to working with Kenya to develop our economic and commercial relationship. And there have been numerous follow-up US cabinet level engagements uh, subsequent to that, including uh, recently between US Trade Representative Tai and Cabinet Secretary Mina. Uh, USTR is now reviewing the status of negotiations and the text of the US-Kenya Free Trade Agreement with a focus on a worker-centered uh, values, resilient uh, pandemic recovery, and of course, strengthening the US-Kenya economic and trade relationship. We continue to pursue a whole of government approach in enhancing our ties with Kenya while expanding many long-term opportunities for the US private sector. I think as many, many of you are aware, the Millennium Challenge Corporation has awarded Kenya a threshold program and is now developing projects under the program to address Kenya's constraints to growth. MCC's team is in Kenya this week, in fact, even as we speak, and they're exploring possible programs to improve urban connectivity in the Nairobi area. On August 25th, uh, the government of Kenya also formally joined the US Trade and Development Agency's Global Procurement Initiative under this partnership, USTDA will train public procurement officials to obtain the greatest value for money for Kenya's public infrastructure investments. 
We are so pleased that Kenya has become the 14th partner country to be inducted into this initiative. And we very much look forward to greater opportunities for US companies to compete in future infrastructure procurement tenders. And of course, our foreign commercial service working very closely with the interagency here in Nairobi continues to coordinate vigorous advocacy on behalf of US companies, not only on commercial deals, but also to remove trade barriers and promote market access for US goods and services. While we currently find ourselves faced with a wide range of challenges and uncertainty arising from the COVID-19 pandemic, I do believe that even in these times, we still have a great deal to look forward to. And I'm very excited and optimistic for what the US Kenya commercial engagement has in store for us. So with those few words, thank you all very much and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Eric. To move on to Ambassador Woman. Uh, thank you very much, Maxwell, and uh, hopefully the storm won't impinge on my brief remarks, or maybe they will help intervene to make them shorter. Um, but I remember two years ago, as we in Rwanda were on the cusp of creating an American Chamber of Commerce, that we visited you, uh, you and the U.S. Embassy, and indeed the President of Kenya welcomed the AmCham's of the region uh, to a conference in Nairobi to bring energies of our memberships, our leaderships, um, the boards and directors of the AmCham's of the region, loosely defined as the groups that have joined us today virtually. Little would I have known that we would be coming in a Zoom format as opposed to coming to Kenya or to Dar es Salaam or to Addis Ababa or Kampala or Kigali for that matter. But I think it's auspicious that that initiative has continued because um, this combination of mixing government, and as Camille said, the Prosper Africa Initiative to galvanize the agencies of the US government and all the alphabet soup that that entails with the spirit of enterprise collaboration and innovation uh, exemplified by our corporate sponsor today, Abbott. Uh, they were the winners uh, of the Corporate Excellence Award from the Secretary of State uh, this past year, uh, early in the, in the year. And uh, I'm gonna do a, a, you know, a promo for their, for their test kits, which I'm a big consumer of in this time of COVID. But um, really the combination of having um, government and private sector work together is something that I think is crucial. Um, as, a, as an ambassador or chief of mission, um, I spend money and I'm not somebody who's an entrepreneur who makes money. And so I find that the synergies, for example, of working with Lauren Nicaragua of the AmCham uh, to find ways to help. How can government help business find opportunities? And here's something I'm going to leave you with, and I'll leave the rest, I'll yield the rest of my time to my colleagues and to questions, is by thinking regionally and not even within the, rural, the, the region of Horn of Africa, thinking where the logical connections are between the trading ports of Dar es Salaam, Mombasa, um, and then the, the inner inland cities and, and big growing population centers of Kampala, Kigali, Goma, and Eastern Congo, and Bujumbura eventually as well. How can we help American business find and in fact build the railroad roads, the roads, um, and the infrastructure and the businesses that will provide the jobs for, uh, for the next generation of African young people. And that's really where I think we can be of help. I would ask and encourage everyone in the business communities of all the countries that are participating today to reach out when you travel to the AmCham's of uh, the countries you're going to. If you're coming to Kigali, talk to the AmCham, get their briefing, get the lay of the land, and indeed, facilitate this exchange of views. When, when I was first here, I invited my colleague, the, the, the CDA of uh, Tanzania to come to my residence and meet interested members of the new AmCham here to find out from the horse's mouth, so to speak, what it is to do business in Dar es Salaam and how can an embassy, our embassy, uh, facilitate the work that's there. Finally, I would just say that AmCham's are not the only advocacy for business in the region. We work closely with the European Business Association and indeed help pave the way for their accreditation here in Rwanda. Similarly, when I was in Ethiopia, we did, we did the same. And together we can be vibrant voices for the private sector and work to help clear the way and make it easier for government and business to make headway to increase investment and trade between our countries. So I yield the floor back to you, Maxwell. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those remarks, Ambassador. I will now quickly turn it over to uh, DCM Christopher Kraft. 
for your opening remarks. Thank you, Maxwell. Uh, it's really an honor to join you all today to participate in this forum, and um, and I, I would just associate myself with the remarks that, uh, that my colleagues made with regard to, to how we see, um, you know, the importance of the, dy the dynamic between uh, business and government here. Um, specifically with regard to Uganda, we see it as an exciting market, both both for the good and the bad at times, uh, with both significant opportunities, but also significant challenges. Uh, in our view, some of the top prospect sectors for U.S. exports and, and where we see the, you know, the, 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 the best prospects for, for moving forward in, in uh, our partnership is in the power and energy sector, agriculture and construction, information and communications technology and healthcare. Uh, as, as I'm sure that many of you are aware from, from some of the news articles that, uh, that you follow, um, the emergency, emerging oil industry is really the big positive commercial news story for Uganda this year. Uh, with agreements between the governments of Uganda and Tanzania and oil and gas companies Total and Sinuk. Oil exports look poised to begin perhaps as early as 2025 from Uganda. And in June, a consortium led by the U.S. firm McDermott International received an approximately $2 billion deal from Total to provide engineering, procurement, and construction, um, and commissioning services uh, for its uh, Talenga project. So McDermott's EPC Contract alone has the potential to stimulate economic growth in Uganda and create up to 20,000 direct and indirect jobs, which really brings a significant number of meaningful training opportunities to the local labor force. So we're excited about the uh, economic benefits of the emerging oil sector, particularly for investors in engineering, project management, vocational training, uh, environmental hazard management, and petroleum industry equipment exports field. Um, but at the same time, as the global community looks to address climate change, um, it may seem a little counterintuitive, but the United States is actually um, you know, leading on building and promoting an energy mix that will significantly reduce carbon emissions and lead to a sustainable future. So we're also excited by a, a U.S. -led consortium, Yatra Limited, um, which has uh, won the tender to build East Africa's first uh, oil refinery here, which will produce high quality uh, refined products, uh, lessen the need for, for the uh, transporting in refined products from outside the region, and also um, hopefully eventually through the uh, expanded use of natural gas begin to, to limit the, the deforestation uh, because of the use of charcoal. So um, as we do these, uh, all of this, we're, we're, we believe American expertise, technology, and business standards can help ensure effective environmental stewardship and adherence to land rights best practices um, in the oil sector. Um, just briefly then on, on challenges as, as we pursue and help the Ugandan government pursue ambitious and economic growth goals to restore some of the historical growth rates that, uh, that they enjoyed in the past years prior to the, uh, the, the COVID uh, uh, slowdown. The United States continues to support Ugandans working to combat corruption, to improve the business climate, as well as to strengthen democratic institutions, the rule of law, and the capacity of civil society organizations. And on that, we've been very transparent, frankly, in expressing our concerns about the conduct of Uganda's 2021 elections, about the violence that took place in the run-up to those elections, and to uh, restrictions on civil society organizations operating in the democratic and uh, governance space, um, both before, during, and frankly, right up to today um, uh, during the election. So these challenges that I've outlined are, are real and significant, but so are the opportunities to increase U.S. trade and investment. So, I look forward to continuing to uh, to discuss this through our questions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. Um, so let, let's 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 get a conversation going here, and I want us to start off with well, what we are all experiencing with the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic has really exposed the soft underbelly um, of economies. You know, when you're talking about the health vulnerability, the supply chains vulnerability um, and so on. And I think Africa has not been spared um, and with each country sort of finding its own way of withering the COVID pandemic storm. My two questions are, from where you sit, what are some of the steps that you would say um, have been taken or should be taken to lay the groundwork for stronger partnerships around uh, health with the support of the US government, um, you know, the work that you are doing. And then the second part of that question is, what do you see as a likely impact of the pandemic um, as far as the commercial relationship with the US is concerned? Are you seeing opportunities? 
given the pandemic or, or is it bound to negatively impact that uh, in the medium to, to, to long term? So it's, it's, it's an open conversation. Just feel free to chime in as, as, as you please. Woman wants to go first, Ambassador Woman, go ahead. Thank you, Max. So that's a great question. And, you know, I think no one in my generation, I've been in the Foreign Service 30 years, would have thought that health diplomacy and that global health in general would be such a big part of diplomacy. And I think that um, the pandemic has taught us that the greatest threat to national security, whether it's Rwanda's national security, Kenya's national security, or the American national security, is pandemic threat. And so healthcare is obviously going to be a huge part of national security and also a potential area of opportunity for business. Um, as you can, you know, Rwanda just reached a threshold in its objective of vaccinating 10% of its population. A lot of that vaccine came from uh, U.S. donations through COVAX and other countries' donations as well. And importantly, the government of Rwanda has put its own money and its own IDA loans from the World Bank to use in purchasing bilaterally vaccines bilaterally and then through the Africa Union AVAT mechanism. But beyond that, I see an opportunity for many American businesses in the bioscience field because Rwanda wants to produce mRNA vaccines here in, in Rwanda. That's their aspiration. It's huge, uh, but they have the will to do that. They're working closely with BioNTech, but they're also working with other US partners to see how they can get the the whole value chain that's necessary for a vibrant pharmaceutical uh, industry. Uh, it's, it's a tall order, but that is something an example, I would say, given um, the foothold of some pharmaceuticals in, in Kenya and elsewhere, where there can be collab collaboration because the market is big, the demand is huge and will continue. Over. Go ahead, Eric, go ahead. Thank you, Roman. Thanks, Maxwell. I would, I would echo uh, everything that Ambassador Vrooman said. I, in, the, in the Kenyan context, uh, obviously, this has had a really negative impact on U.S. investment here in Kenya. I think that that goes without saying that applies uh, virtually everywhere. But the good news is we know uh, how to get out of this. And it's, it's all about vaccinating our way out of this. And just as in Rwanda, in uh, the United States, in, in the Kenyan context is the largest donor in terms of uh, vaccines we've donated over 4 million doses, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to date. Uh, in terms of the overall mitigation efforts that have taken place in Kenya, we've been a really close partner with the Kenyan government, which has done a, a really outstanding job. I believe we've donated two mobile field hospitals. We've donated uh, over 5 million surgical masks. Uh, we have, as a result of our deep partnership, health partnership over the years and CDC laboratories across the country, we've done quite a bit of work in terms of detection uh, surveillance, genomic sequencing. So I think in many ways, our partnership, our relationship has grown stronger as a result of this pandemic. And I definitely think the future is very bright uh, for US investment opportunities here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Christopher, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, thanks, Maxwell. It's interesting. I, I uh, as Ambassador Freeman was talking about um, you know, health diplomacy, I fully Fully agree. I think many of us, most of us, come into the, into the diplomatic realm without a, a, a master's in public health, and um, and so we've, we've learned quite a bit over the last few years. But I would say, really, when you're talking about steps taken to lay the groundwork for stronger health partnership, um, honestly, it's difficult for me sometimes, at least from my perspective here in Uganda, to see how we could possibly have a stronger partnership because public health is really where we've where we've really put our money over the last two decades. And a lot of that is because of PEPFAR. So, you know, nowhere is the impact of decades of U.S. government investment, at least in Uganda, but similarly in Kenya and many other countries in the region, is it felt more clearly than here in the health sector where, you know, at least just in Uganda alone, we invest about $500 million a year. Um, it's why most of the people working in this big building here in Kampala, that's why they're here is to help administer and to oversee that program, um, and it's not just PEPFAR, it's to help Ugandans live healthy lives, strengthen health systems, um, so they can go on to live healthy lives long into the future. So, you know, the U.S. here, aside from everything we've done with PEPFAR, we've helped to reduce rates of malaria in young children by 77% since 2006. Um, uh, after decades of, of investment, Uganda's now, as we are in many countries, like in Zambia, where I served last, on the cusp of achieving epidemiology 
epidemiological control of HIV, but specifically with regard to COVID and its impact on that relationship since the pandemic began last year, um, we provided over $130 million in funding, either in reprogrammed or new money to the government, well, to Uganda um, to, uh, to help specifically to prevent, detect, and respond to COVID-19. Um, as Das Richardson uh, had, had noted earlier, um, within the last couple of weeks, we've done two deliveries of vaccines, about uh, three, two, yeah, 2.2 3, million doses of, of both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines with a promise of about 3.4 million more in the next quarter, um, and provided a lot of funding to enable the Ugandan government and the Ministry of Health to, to push that out into the field, into districts around the country. So um, really, we're we're at the forefront and, and really hand in hand in partnership with the Ugandan government on here. So it's uh, it's difficult for me to see that partnership being stronger, but anyways, to fill gaps in Uganda's health sector, including in the response to the pandemic, um, US companies also are driving innovation, whether it's in e-health, in telemedicine, medical equipment sectors, among others. So we really believe that um, this will continue to help the people of Uganda and also help to strengthen our commercial relationship going forward. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I completely echo that. Um, I think there's there's opportunities in in terms of the innovations that also support the health ecosystem as well. Um, so thank you, thank you for those remarks. Now, um, the new administration, the Biden administration, no longer new, I must say, um, has announced a new push to expand business ties between uh, Africa and the U.S. Um, with a focus on clean energy, health, agribusiness, transformation infrastructure, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, DS Camille talked about this quite, quite eloquently um, during her remarks. Now, you couple that with the commencement of trade under the Africa continental free trade area, and you start seeing some very intriguing pathways for stronger engagement, that commercial engagement between the US, um, East Africa, um, you know, from an economic partnership perspective. I, I know Chris did, Christopher did talk about some of the opportunities that you're seeing in Uganda, but I'd just like us to delve a little more into that um, and explore, you know, in the, in the various countries that you, you sit. What are some of those opportunities? If you could just highlight the top three opportunities that you're looking at, uh, but more importantly, how can business, how can U.S. businesses, how can local businesses affiliated to the, the U.S. businesses in, in the region engage in those opportunities and what sort of support can they receive from your offices? Wants to go first? Ambassador Bruman, you want to go first? Sure. Go ahead. Um, yeah. I'll do, well, I'll at least cite two, but one I'm going to talk about regionally. In terms of uh, President Biden's Build Back Better World Partnership, I think that if our region thinks big, the one area that's really gonna be the change or gonna bring a huge amount of change is turning Eastern Congo, and they're not represented here with us today, but Congo may soon be joining the EAC and DRC that is. And with a standard gauge rail connection between between all the, well, I don't know about Ethiopia, but uh, they have their own connections to the sea through rail, but, but with Mombasa to Uganda and from Dar es Salaam to Isaka and then forward to any one of the Great Lakes or through, to, through Rwanda to Goma, um, there's huge potential to build the infrastructure upon which uh, these countries and their economies will grow. And I think that will ultimately contribute to economic and geopolitical stability on the continent and drive growth, not only in infrastructure driven growth, but clean technologies drive the, uh, drive the uh, you know, basically trained as a much more economical uh, means of bringing produce from the Central African Great Lakes region to the ports and, and vice versa, but it will be a huge dynamic change agent in the years to come. The economics are not there. Many skeptics will say this is not viable, and that's probably true right now, but thinking big, that's what we need to do, harnessing the Development Finance Corporation to, to look into this market. The second thing, and I'll, I'll close with this, is that um, not only the Africa Free Trade Agreements, but the free movement of peoples will, I think, create a huge dynamic area where a small country, 
or countries like Burundi or Rwanda can really benefit. Rwanda has opened and been one of the first countries to ratify that agreement and has enabled students and businesses from Kenya, from Eastern Congo and other parts of the continent to come here and work in institutions and study in institutions like Carnegie Mellon University's campus here, the, the Rwanda Institute of Conservation Agriculture, the University of Global Health Equity, and many others that have been founded through US investments in the education sector. So education will be a key driver of the human talent that will complement the infrastructure that's needed in the years to come. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Eric? Thanks, Maxwell. Uh, Des Richardson outlined the many initiatives that are underway in Washington. They're gonna have very exciting implications for US investment in Kenya. Uh, beyond those, I would just highlight two, which I already touched on. One is, uh, of course, the Millennium Challenge Corporation uh, threshold program, which is underway here. Uh, we're very excited about, I think will we'll help create a better uh, investment climate for US investors. And the second one, of course, is the US-Kenya Free Trade Agreement. As I noted, uh, that those discussions uh, are currently uh, on hold, uh, but our teams are, are talking, the USTR is talking uh, with counterparts here in Kenya. And, and needless to say, as that moves forward, uh, that will have exciting implications uh, for investment as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something that uh, I'm sure you're all aware that we're very, very keen on just to see how we can help support get that over the line. So looking forward to that as well. Um, Christopher? Thanks, Maxwell. Um, yeah, I talked a little earlier at the top of my remarks with regard to some of the, the key sectors that we think um, have potential for a great deal of growth. And so I don't want to be redundant. I won't report, repeat myself in the power sector or or um, on healthcare, but I, I would want to highlight just uh, some US private sector investments, particularly in ICT. Um, earlier this year, uh, Raxio, which is a company owned by US investors, opened a $15 million tier three data center here in Kampala, Uganda's first uh, tier three center. And, uh, and it will, uh, we believe, will really help to drive economic growth, social development, and digital transformation and provide Ugandans with more efficient access to, to cloud based services. Um, drive costs down and improve connection speed. And it's also creating STEM jobs, 40% um, of, of which uh, their staff are women. So it's uh, exciting, I think, as companies look to perhaps invest in the ICT space, we really see specific opportunities for you know, building uh, additional data centers, providing data security services, uh, internet services, and exporting telecommunications hardware, fiber optic equipment, and network uh, hardware. Um, Others have already talked a little bit about, um, you know, the opportunities that the U.S. government can provide from Washington through PFC and other entities. I'll, I'll talk just really quickly about some things, though, that we're doing here locally to try to improve the the, uh, the business environment. It's mostly through USAID funding, uh, through our economic growth uh, and the, the private sector outreach office there. Um, in agribusiness, there's a new USAID strategic investments activity, which is five years, $20 million program to promote inclusive growth in the agriculture sector by attracting private investment, both local and international. Um, and that program will catalyze a, a variety of potential agricultural investments here in Uganda from equity investors, entrepreneurs, pension funds, banks, impact funds, and, and et cetera. So um, we're excited about that. Uh, and also through USAID, Uganda's domestic revenue for development activity, uh, we're supporting structural, operational, and policy improvements at the Uganda Revenue Authority, which we think is really key. Uh, the investment will, will help to strengthen and broaden Uganda's revenue base, support tax code reform, and improve URA's core capabilities, hopefully resulting in fairer and more consistent tax treatment uh, for U.S. companies operating in Uganda, because that's um, really critical. And, and for all the, the some of the positive things I mentioned, there have been some real setbacks in the commercial, uh, in the in the business realm here with regard to, um, you know, several large multi uh, multi uh, uh, international investors pulling out. Both Afrocell uh, announcing that they're leaving the Uganda market in the coming weeks, uh, and Shoprite, based in South Africa, uh, leaving the market as well. So, uh, and a lot of that is driven by slow down in COVID, but also I think, uh, you know, officials in those companies will, will also talk about some of the restrictions in the uh, in governance here that need to be addressed. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we, we are already out of time, but I'll, I want to give each one of you just 30 seconds closing remarks uh, so that we can kick over to the next one. We'll start with the Ambassador of Women. 
Uh, thank you very much. And I would just say one last pitch for Rwanda, um, whether it's the World Bank or whether it's the recent Rand Merchant uh, Bank, they've rated Rwanda is one of the great places to invest because of the absence of corruption, a stable and secure environment for doing and scaling pilot uh, initiatives. So for example, innovations, our biggest investment has been Contour Global's investment in taking the methane from the, the Lake Kivu and turning it into natural gas for generation of uh, baseload power in Rwanda. Another a great, a great example, uh, Culligan, which has been able to purify all of Kigali, Kigali's water. This is a demonstration for what may be done in Goma, Bujumbura, and the like, Bujumbura or um, Bukavu. And so I think if we think of these markets in the future, I would say that the intra-African trade will be great and the, rate, the role that American companies can play in helping dynamize that market will be terrific. Back over to you, Maxwell. Thank you, thank you for that. I'll move over to Eric. Thank you, Maxwell. And again, a, a huge thanks to everybody for organizing this today. I would just close by saying that if you do uh, have an interest in investing in Kenya, please reach out to us. Uh, we're open 24 seven. For any questions, uh, concerns that you might have, we're happy to address them. We have an outstanding foreign commercial service team here, uh, and we look forward to partnering, partnering with you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Christopher? Yeah, absolutely. I echo my colleagues' uh, statements. I, I will say, having uh, spent more of my career in other parts of Africa, I find this, this part of Africa to be particularly dynamic. Uh, people are competitive here. They, they're, they're willing to work hard. I think there are great opportunities. Um, and uh, as Eric just said, we too stand ready to, to work with uh, any U.S. businesses, and I look forward to hearing from our AmCham colleagues to hear how we can do that better. Thanks. Fantastic. Well, Ambassador Vruman, CDA, Nidla, DCM, Kraft, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have this discussion, moderate this discussion with you. Thank you for your refreshing candor and insights that you've shared, and we certainly look forward to how we can partner even closer with your offices to ensure that we push this commercial agenda uh, between the US and the East African countries that we represent. So thank you very much. With that, I want to now turn it over to my good friend, Kendra Gaida, um, Vice President of the US Africa Business Center at the US Chamber of Commerce, who will lead a panel discussion with the board presidents of Amcham Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Ethiopia. Over to you, Kendra. Welcome, and the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maxwell. Um, good day to everyone. I want to invite our MGM leaders to turn on their cameras so that we can begin our panel. And as they do that, I just want to thank the preceding um, leaders for uh, setting a, a very broad-based agenda for, for our, our MGM leaders to react to. So to get us started and to, to be judicious with our time, I'm going to collapse some of the questions that we were prepared to discuss today to make sure that we uh, can cover all the ground. So I'm going to um, recognize you all in turn um, and ask that you would share with us um, the AmCham that you represent, um, the priorities of your AmCham, and some of those biggest challenges or barriers just to, to kick off and, and set the stage for us. I'd like to start first with Brenda and Bati. And Brenda, as you uh, give us your AmCham affiliation, would you then tell us also your, um, your day job? Because we know that you all are wearing dual hats as our AmCham leaders. And then tell us about the priorities of your AmCham as well as some of those barriers that you're addressing in your work. Thank you, Kendra. Um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Um, before I give my few remarks and say who I am, I just also would like to extend a big thank you to Abbott and Echo Bank for supporting this dialogue. It's really important. My name is Brenda Mbathi. I'm the president for AmCham in Kenya. My day job, as Kendra says, I am the president for General Electric GE in East Africa. So it's a truly a pleasure to be here today because I represent all the markets um, that are on this panel. But I'm going to talk specifically about AmCham Kenya in this regard. So firstly, I want to say I'm, I'm truly honored to have this position to be the president because I work with a fabulous CEO, Maxwell, who's just moderated uh, the previous panel. And indeed, um, working with the US Embassy here in Kenya, it's, it's just a true pleasure. I do say that I also interact with all the other uh, US embassies. And I, I just want to also say upfront, you give us immense support 
And um, I, I want to say that up front, uh, Charles de Fer, Mr. Needler, you also said that, um, you know, you're always open for business. And I can truly testify that you are open 24 seven for all of us, especially during the challenges. So Amcham uh, Kenya is focused on playing a central role in supporting the overall economic development of Kenya through solutions and innovations by US companies. And again, Abbott illustrated some of those innovations that US companies offer. But we also support our members to our members with opportunities through specific business policy advocacy. So um, Amcham Kenya conducts policy analysis across the different sectors to identify policy issues, and there are many that businesses face and proposing interventions to support a more enabling business environment. And I have to say it's a it's joy to hear that the US Embassy will be giving support um, on public procurement practices here in Kenya. That is very key for most US businesses. Indeed, also supporting with market intelligence, the provision of market and Inform investment information to allow us to know the information for opportunities to companies to address the existing fragmentation and poor quality of information and to increase market confidence. Sometimes it's available, sometimes it isn't. We do have government institutions that offer this, but sometimes you need to get all the information in one place. Then also for trade and investment promotion, and this would be a similar forum that we're having today, business advisory, business to business linkages and market entry support. This is very key and, and indeed with um, Camille talking about uh, the, the session in Dubai next year, hopefully that will also give some, some impetus and some uh, support for that because structured support in market entry and expansion accelerates and eases the process for various businesses and gives them confidence in the market. Let me just also say something here. I speak here because I work for a large US um, corporation, but I do see that there is a need to focus on SMEs, MSMEs, and how we can support them as they look to enter into this um, market. And maybe I would just like to throw a suggestion. I know uh, personally, I have supported other large business US businesses in their entry into this market by specifically holding their hand, bringing them to AmCham, and just showing them the ropes. And perhaps we could have some structured support where we can do a sort of buddy system to various SMEs or MSMEs that would like to enter into these markets. It doesn't need to be in places where we operate and that will allow for you know, better governance, but I think we can put up our hand and say, we'd be ready to support so going forward. In terms of our US government partnership, I think US governments um, can support companies through deepening partnerships with governments to improve the business environment. And I alluded to at least um, the partnership on public procurement. I would previously, had it been a couple of weeks ago, talked about the ease of doing business, but I'll be cautious about that now. But I do want to say that what we do need to recognize is the cost of doing business. And indeed, um, the representative from the US embassy in Uganda mentioned this, you know, you don't want to have these large corporations departing from our markets due to what they're saying is perhaps lack of transparency and governance. So what more, what additional technical assistance can be given in these areas? Financial support to US companies. Now, when I talk about financial support, I'm talking about the various instruments that are available and that they are there, but I think the risk factor needs to perhaps be readdressed um, because I think sometimes we do lose opportunity because we, we have, um, we, we look at the risk factor in ways that other companies or other governments may not look at in the same way. And then supporting the work of our AmCHAMs through sector specific outreach and engagement to the US private sector to elevate, to alleviate, sorry, skepticism about market opportunities and doing business in East Africa, because that still exists. And we're truly hopeful and I'm really happy to hear um, Eric Needler talk about um, perhaps there's still some discussion on Kenya's FTA with the US government because we are very hopeful about that. But indeed, we're also hopeful about broader AFTAC in interventions between our markets and the US government. Thank you very much, Kendra. Thank you for that, Brenda. Um, I'd like to turn now to Lauren. Uh... 
in sorry, Naranga, pardon me, uh, to give us the same top top points on the priorities of your AmCham, your day job, and uh, the challenges that you all are focused on um, at your AmCham. Sure. So I'm Lauren Narunga here in Rwanda. And in terms of what I do every day, I started a food distribution company called Get It. Um, we're the largest distributor of fresh produce in the country, both domestically, and then we also have an export arm. Um, I also work with a range of investors uh, and help facilitate investments uh, into Rwandan companies. In terms of our priorities, we really have three main priorities. Uh, Primarily, it's business intelligence. Um, there's not a lot published in Rwanda about how to do business and the real way that you get connection into doing business here and really making things happen is being connected into community. And it's and it's really individuals who allow us to connect into that information, um, especially since so much of the information is also uh, in Kinyarwanda and not in English. And so we really serve as that connection to know what's going on, what's the latest, what's going on with government, what's going on in the business community um, for our membership. We also are, bring the American business community not only together with each other, but also connect them into the wider business community in Rwanda uh, and of course within East Africa. Rwanda is a small market. It's a place that has one of the you know, fastest growing economies in Africa. Last quarter, we had 20% GDP growth, which sounds insane, but anecdotally, both uh, the companies that I work with and others have seen record sales numbers over the summer, even during our most intense lockdowns. So we're really seeing dramatic growth here and Rwanda is a great place to start a business, um, but then we help our, our membership really connect into East Africa and other export opportunities, whether that's uh, in the US, Europe or elsewhere. We then of course work within the advocacy arm uh, to manage and help our business community to make business easier. Uh, right now, for example, we're working on a land issue. Uh, we're able to coordinate across uh, advocacy, not only within the US government uh, and our community, but also with the European community uh, and others as well. So we're really able to take the concerns of the business community. Again, Rwanda is really small. And so that doesn't have to be any individual uh, business person um, that's putting these policy proposals forward. Um, we're able to serve as that aggregate, get access to the highest levels of government and make those policy recommendations and really move the needle on making Rwanda an even better place to do business. In terms of our top challenges, as I said, Rwanda is a small market. So being able to attract the right kind of financing for our companies, being able to create the right kind of policy environment for our companies is uh, definitely a big challenge for us. Things like logistics, getting inputs, getting uh, our goods out of the country because of the challenges of the region. Um, that's something too that we're able to connect our members into helping them just do business. Uh, most supply chains don't exist here. And so generally businesses that are starting in Rwanda own the entire supply chain for, what, for whatever they're doing. And so of course that's going to run into a range of challenges, whether it's importing containers or dealing with your water. And so we're able to connect our members into the right systems to be able to fix those uh, those challenges. Um, but also, of course, it continues to be a, a challenge for us. And so I think this is also where connecting into a wider East African community is so important because so much of what we're doing here in Rwanda depends on what's going on in the region. Um, and then just as a final uh, is issue of getting things, um, as I said, Rwanda doesn't have a lot. We don't have a lot of packaging, for example. We don't have a lot of uh, seed production. We don't have, you know, kind of the range of those raw materials. Also, we're really looking for East Africa to help us with. Um, and so as we make those deeper connections into the region, as our markets here continue to grow, as the opportunities continue to grow, because it is such an easy place to do business, as Ambassador Bruman was talking about, um, we're able to then what we're hoping is that connections like this can really overcome those challenges and we can continue to integrate Rwanda both regionally and internationally um, as it becomes more and more of a, of a place that people come to do business. So thanks so much, Kendra and, and our other panelists. Thank you, Laura. And I, you put a lot on the table as well there. So we're gonna turn to Joseph to, to help um, give us a perspective from uh, Tanzania. And I will note that we are having some connection challenges with our colleague in Ethiopia. We hope He'll join, but if at some point he does get on again, I may pause to make sure we can hear from him before Tech Challenges over, overtake us. So Joseph, um, your introduction, uh, who you represent in terms of your day job and AmCham, the priorities and challenges that you all are focused on. 
Thank you, Kendra. Um, so just to know that I represent uh, Geoffrey, who was a who was a chair of AMCHAM in Tanzania. Um, however, I'm an active member of AMCHAM and uh, I lead Ernst Young here in Tanzania. Um, <clears throat> so as you know, it's interesting time in Tanzania with the abrupt change in country leadership. Uh, and, and uh, that's not only the president, but also at the ministerial level. So one of the key issues that Tanzania is facing is issues around uh, policy, uh, predictability, and, uh, and all issues around doing business. So AMSHAM is actively engaged in the public policy dialogue with the governments uh, through forums, with public leaders and authorities, all solely aiming to improve uh, business environment and hence um, American businesses in, in, in Tanzania. Very recently, uh, we, we had a, a session, Amsham arranged session with the ministry, two ministers, Minister for Trade and Investment, and, and also um, with the Tanzania Investment Center, which uh, enables uh, uh, American investors and Amsham members to, to have one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the ministers with regards to government policies uh, and changes. Um, but also, uh, at present, AMCHAM in Tanzania is actively engaged in, in branding uh, aspects in terms of raising awareness of uh, the chamber itself uh, uh, through the launch of social media uh, platforms uh, so that it can actually reach many peoples. And uh, in terms of actually adding, uh, it's pretty young uh, uh, chamber and uh, larger efforts are being made in terms of uh, widening membership base uh, and this is actually also including attracting uh, businesses with connections uh, uh, in the US beat uh, agents or customer major customer base or supplier based. Um, <clears throat> the also <clears throat> priority also include uh, strengthening partnership with other trade facilitation promotion uh, entities in Tanzania including Tanzania private sector foundations uh, and, and uh, the Tato Tanzania Association of Tour Operators and Holtida Culture Taha and Chamber of Commerce, other Chamber of Commerce uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, forums have also been held with the other um, uh, chambers, similar chambers, uh, British Business Group and uh, EU uh, Business Group in Tanzania. And so those are some of the initiatives so that they, there is a collaborative approach with the governments. Key challenges, as I said, change in leadership and uh, at largely at, uh, at all sectors in the public authorities and, and uh, pretty new ministers uh, uh, and hence in terms of uh, implementations has, 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 has been a big issue. Public uh, sector service delivery is also one of the big issues uh, that members face. And that's certainly included in the policy dialogue with the governments that uh, AMCHAM is spearheading uh, in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I appreciate that. Um, I want to turn now to our colleague from Antium Ethiopia, Ernest, who's representing the board. Uh, thank you for persevering through the tech challenges. You would tell us um, uh, about the Amcham you represent, briefly highlighting the priorities that you are focused on as an Amcham and uh, the top uh, two barriers or challenges that you all are focused on in terms of improving the business environment. Um, thank you. Uh, my apologies. Uh, there, there was an overlap in my my schedule, so I'm slightly I've been in and out. Uh, but uh, I think on behalf of the Ethiopian Chamber, um, what we are doing at the moment is really to consolidate Amcham's influence in the business community here in Ethiopia. Um, as you all know, Ethiopia is going through um, massive transformation efforts in. In, in every way, both political and economic. And um, AMCHAM has, uh, has uh, an opportunity to, to be able to build bridges and, 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 and open up a more trade uh, relationship uh, uh, with, uh, with the US and Ethiopian counterparts. Um, then I think relative to a lot of the other fellow AMCHAMs uh, in East Africa, um, the Ethiopian has been fairly um, a latecomer. Uh, I think our membership base, I'm sure Hannah will outline this later, but uh, less than 100 members. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we have some, uh, some prominent names in our board, including uh, General Electric, Coca-Cola, uh, and, uh, and Dow Chemical, etc. So the foundation of AMCHAM has only been uh, for less than three years or so 
here in Ethiopia. And what we are focusing right now is really trying to find our, our, our influence in, and, and, and identify um, relevant services for our members as we build our membership base. Uh, uh, we're building bridges with uh, government institutions. We're building bridges with um, US counterparts and across uh, East Africa. Uh, we've identified um, a sort of um, an East Africa hub uh, as an idea that we've been bubbling up with over the past uh, few months is uh, something that we can take forward consistent with Africa Union initiatives, but also to be able to influence and enhance trade uh, with, from the US with Africa. So uh, we think that that's a, a platform that's unique to Ethiopia because uh, um, a lot of the meetings that are happening here, here in Ethiopia could be an instrument that we can use uh, uh, to take this on a forward trajectory. In terms of challenges, I think, you know, is, is, there's no doubt uh, at the moment we're going through a number of challenges, uh, as I said, both political and economic, and uh, I, I would rather not go into details of that. But uh, I think our, our membership base uh, and the, the general business sentiment in Ethiopia is very resilient. Uh, the Ethiopian economy uh, is quite diverse and it's, uh, it's looking uh, to put this behind in the near future. So um, um, that's, that's a, a short synopsis of uh, uh, the, the, the Ethiopian Chamber perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Amias. Um, I like the idea of building bridges and I wanna to turn to our colleague, Mike Davis to build a bridge to him and his comments about the work that MJ Muganda is doing. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mike Davis. I'm the chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce of Uganda. Um, my day job, I'm the chief operating officer of Veritas Investments, which is a private local multi-sector investment company uh, where we invest in many different entities throughout the, the country and the region. Um, as part of that, I'm also the CEO of House of Concrete, which does in situ concrete uh, for the oil and gas industry and construction industry. Um, with regards to the AmCham Uganda, our top priorities are working with members and the U.S. mission to increase and bring positive light to the efforts of American investment into the country and region. Uh, we lobby the government together uh, to encourage easier access to American brands technology corporations into the growing Ugandan market. Um, we work with the U.S. Uh, mission um, very well here. Uh, in fact, I came directly from a meeting with them to here, um, and we continue to collaborate on multiple fronts um, and have had multiple successes, um, including pushing back on the corporate nationalization effort on the local content bill that was presented to uh, the president last year. And essentially that, that bill would effectively force uh, multinational corporations to sell their local, their interests locally to a, a, a Ugandan national um, without uh, or, uh, relevant compensation. And so we, we helped, uh, we worked with the, the embassy to push that back on that and we were successful in that. Uh, we're hopefully continuing these efforts uh, and be collaborative. Um, specifically working with the embassy and, um, and our members to, to do things like expedite visas for business trips to the U.S. to allow for face-to-face -face negotiations, uh, to improve, improve bilateral trade, uh, tag teaming on policy and advocacy efforts uh, for a positive commercial environment, and then finding specific efforts, um, funding specific efforts to improve visibility of American government and American business efforts in Uganda. Um, as we see, we, we're American, American generals in a competition uh, with, with China, with India, and the Chinese have done a very good mar a job of marketing their, their impacts here. Uh, whereas we believe the American side, I mean, we've given how many millions of vaccines and no one really takes, I mean, if you look at the paper yesterday, it was a picture of the ambassador and yeah, there's more vaccines here, not really attributing it to the U.S. Um, as, a, as a full effort, like it would be where a Chinese company would contribute 20 beds. So we're work, working with the embassy to find ways to do that. Now, on the other side, what are the, the barriers and challenges to, to enhancing trade investment? Um, I wanted to, to um, in comment on uh, DCM Crafts um, comment. It was actually uh, four major companies have left, uh, multinational companies have left Uganda in the last year, specifically three American companies. AIG Insurance has left the Ugandan market. Afrocell, which is an American company. Game, which is owned by Walmart, has left the country in addition to ShopRite, which is more visible, but a little bit smaller relatively. 
Um, so that it's a, it's a big concern um, in terms of the multinational investment um, where the multinational investors are starting to see issues here. Specifically, um, our friends at USAID have been very helpful with the URA um, enhancing the tax base. Sadly, that's also um, had the negative effect of continuously pressing on every foreign investor to pay more taxes and continually pay more taxes and pay more taxes. Um, they're the bane to all investors and corporations, um, but the unfair taxation um, it is, doesn't work. In addition to that, there is a specific policy that um, we believe is the only one in the world that we know of, where U.S. Br or foreign brands, U.S. brands primarily, technologies and licensing are taxed and not recoverable. So you cannot expense them, you cannot offset them, and it's called the foreign ser uh, VAT and withholding tax on foreign services, which is equivalent to 37% tax on any foreign technology or service. As an example, Microsoft 365, G Suite, John Deere, agricultural GPS systems, anything. Um, that's one of the, the, the key things we've been focused on. Um, as an example, one of our members recently received a, a tax bill, um, a penalty in the tax tribunal, um, which basically penalizes them for having an online reservation system outside of Uganda um, at a 37% rate, which es essentially kills, uh, I wouldn't say kills their business, but uh, decreases their business opportunities. Another challenge for us in Uganda um, is the small ticket size for investment. You know, we, we appreciate the efforts of, of the U.S. government and, and, and doing investments, um, but Uganda is a relatively small economy. The, the minimum ticket size of any investment is available for a, roughly a, a dozen companies in Uganda. And so the, what would be very helpful is if we were able to find a different way to work with uh, smaller corporations, medium-sized corporations, what, well, what we call in Uganda medium-sized corporations, um, it would be very valuable where the ticket size should come down on investment down to you know, 500,000 to a million. I know from a VC standpoint, investment standpoint, it's very difficult to do that. But at the end of the day, that's the ticket size here because you have very few corporations that are uh, of that size. Um, and the opportunities are, are immense. It's just a matter of how do you, how do you create a ticket size, which allows the, the U.S. government, the associated vendor, um, investors, through all of these different um, entities like the uh, or Prosper Africa, et cetera, to come into corporations here and build them up and, and invest appropriately. So thank you. That's my submission. Thank you, Mike. Actually, I'm going to stick with you because you've, you've highlighted and ended with Prosper Africa, which is a U.S. government initiative. And our final question where I'm going to ask you all to to highlight some recommendations for the commercial diplomacy engagement between the US government and our AMCHAMs is focused on that. But you all have put a lot of issues on the table in terms of your work, in terms of strengthening the business environment, in terms of collective action, increasing the connectivity, both in collective action, but also pure you know, connectivity in terms of logistics um, and uh, building that business brand and showcasing that uniquely American or US style to doing business as, a, as priorities. So with those priorities that you all have laid out, um, I'm gonna start with Mike, but I'm gonna give you each a, a minute to, to offer us some thoughts. Um, what, what would your recommendations be um, to the US government for how they can partner with the MGMs to encourage greater trade and investment? Uh, that's a tall order for a short amount of time, but we'll start with you, Mike. Then we'll go to Lauren, Joseph, Brenda, and Ermias. I think the, the, the major thing for me, as I mentioned, in terms of investment is focusing on a smaller ticket size um, and in encouraging the, the, um, the investors from the American side to understand that the markets here are, are unique. Rwanda is not Uganda, Rwanda is not Kenya, Uganda is not Kenya, et cetera. And to be able to come in at a, a regional level and establish smaller um, entities or uh, invest in smaller entities throughout the region rather than trying to do a big play, um, uh, you know, $100 million play, which is, is not a viable play. In addition, it's also highlighting opportunities here that we may not see. Um, that the, the embassies may not see. Um, as an example, right now, oil and gas industry is on fire um, in Uganda. We probably will be the last virgin oil fields in the world. 
And right now, um, one of a major American investor is here, uh, McDermott, which is um, will be a, given the contract to with Sinopec to build the the oil facilities, the well pads, the CPF for here. So how do we enhance work together so that American companies and American investors can come into this and work with the group of McDermott, Schlumberger, et cetera, to invest in the in these industries and, and take advantage of our our um, opportunities here and and also do the American way of business. Um, you know, reduce corruption, be transparent, and and make um, make the environment better for everybody, including the chambers and the embassies. Thank you, Mike. Over to you, Lauren. Recommendations that you would offer. Sure. So, in terms of how we actually manage uh, working within the Rwandan context, uh, we find the best way to do that is to recognize both the opportunity and the progress that Rwanda has made. I think there's a lot of foreigners that come in and just talk about all of the challenges of working in these markets. And if we come in and recognize all of the progress that has been made and make sure that we're also then looking toward the opportunity and how we can work in a partnership. Rwanda is a very collaborative place. It's a very community oriented place and everybody wants to work together. So the more, which is a little bit different than how uh, many Americans come in. So I think the more that we can work in that collaborative way, we're really gonna see a lot of progress here. Um, in recent years, I think we've been very pleased with how the diplomatic community has uh, interacted with the Rwandan business community and the Rwandan government. Um, historically, though, there's been a lot of challenges and that presents a lot of challenges for us as a business community when we're criticizing the government on issues that we equally have issues in in America, things around elections and free speech. Um, that doesn't help the American business community here. We've been we've made an incredible amount of progress on that over the last few years. And I think if we can maintain that momentum um, of making sure that we're really leading with our strengths of American business and we're really considering the impacts of our words uh, at a diplomatic level to the American business community in the countries that those words are being uh, directed to, that's really helpful. Um, in terms of opportunities, we're a very fast moving country, low corruption, um, and it's a really regional hub. So while the market itself in terms of Rwanda is very small, we play an incredible role within the region. Um, and it's a great place to be a first mover. So you can come to Rwanda, set up your Africa headquarters, set up your Africa operations. It's easy to do that here and then grow into other countries. We often like to joke that Rwanda is Africa light. Um, so it's a great place to lead. And I would also echo Mike's um, really astute call out on ticket size. Uh, you know, when we're looking at most of the support that the American government provides for uh, foreign American companies, <clears throat> Ticket sizes are, are just out of reach for most American companies that are here in Rwanda. And I think the more that we can work together, I've heard of a number of really encouraging initiatives, and I think we need to continue to grow those to get those ticket sizes within a range that we can really support American companies here in Rwanda to be able to achieve their growth, not only within Rwanda, but within the region. Thank you, Lauren. Joseph, I want to recognize you to share your recommendations for increasing sure. commercial diplomacy. Yeah. Thank you. So, I think, first of all, I would like to thank the American Embassy uh, in Tanzania. So each time we had difficulties getting appointment with the public uh, officials, the embassies always come handy to support us. So I think it's more doing doing more of that. Secondly, it's uh, uh, for the US government creating opportunity or sort of a platform to enable uh, SMEs specifically in Tanzania to be able to connect with these similar businesses in the US. Uh, for any opportunities such as business to business. I think those are the two th uh, that I can actually think of now. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Brenda, your Thank recommendations. You. Yeah, and I know we're, we're short on time. So um, my one um, recommendation would be greater commercial diplomacy, more high level government to business delegations and support. I'll give an example. Yesterday, I attended a session with President Suluhu, and it was with the Tanzania Private Sector Foundation. And it was very much an illustration of how her government was working with the Tanzania Private Sector Foundation and how they had come to America and they wanted to show that force together and opportunities. And I think that this is something that needs to be considered uh, by the US government and embassies on how they showcase their work with private sector because it sends a clear message and then support for American businesses. I can't state this enough. And um, yes, the work done by PAC DBIA, US Chamber, and indeed the AmCham's, I think 
there's more structured processes that need to be addressed because it's a platform that I don't believe we leverage enough and look forward to more. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Hermias will give you the last word for a recommendation on greater uh, um, uh, recommendations to US government for increasing commercial diplomacy. Um, thank you. Um, I think for, for us in Ethiopia, you know, the private sector remains uh, very young. Uh, uh, a lot of the business environment that uh, Mike was mentioning earlier is, is all too new for us here in Ethiopia. Uh, it's not an easy place for US businesses um, to, to, to have a, a, an easy presence and, uh, and, and penetration and to succeed in the business environment. So there's a lot of work, preliminary work that has to be done. Uh, also, democracy is a bit of an experiment uh, in Ethiopia. It's a very large country with a, a huge potential. So uh, I think for the US government, I think uh, it's to understand the diversity of uh, the Ethiopian market, the, the complexity of uh, the political processes, and of course, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to also nurture and grow the private sector. Uh, Ethiopia definitely, definitely lags much, much behind in terms of the private sector participation in the economic uh, development of the country. So uh, I think uh, the US government and the US businesses can do a lot on that space. Thank you. Thank you, Hermias. And as I prepare to turn it over to Anne Awari to close us out, I would like to thank you all for your comments today um, on behalf of your AmCHAMs and thank you for the leadership roles that you all play in promoting business and investment on behalf of US companies. We appreciate that. Um, so Anne, over to you. Thank you so much, Kendra. I take this opportunity to thank our chief guest, Camille. And I also thank the regional US ambassadors, our presidents of the regional chambers. Thank you so much for this uh, fruitful discussion this afternoon. I wouldn't leave without thanking the great team that has made this possible today. The regional AMCHAM executives, Maxwell from AMCHAM Kenya, Hannah, the general manager of Ethiopia, we have Nengai from uh, Tanzania, the GM Tanzania, and Rwanda. Thank you so much for putting this together, the first ever virtual meeting for all the regional arm terms. This wouldn't have been possible without your commitment. Thank you a great deal. And then I would also like to thank the sponsors for this event, the main sponsor, Eb Abbott, Thank you so much for your generosity. And of course, uh, Echo Bank Rwanda, the supporting sponsor, we thank you for supporting this event. To each and everyone that has made this a success today, I greatly acknowledge you for your efforts. And it has been a remarkable virtual interaction. So, I wish each and every one of you a great evening. We look forward for another engaged full edition for regional engagement. Have a great day to those who are in the US and uh, to those in East Africa. We wish you a fantastic evening. This meeting has come to an end and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great day.